Good afternoon. I'm Abby, a clinical assistant professor and PhD student in the academic business units of injury, inflammation, aging, and recovery sciences. Today, we'll be talking about post-operative delirium in older people, what, what's, what's, what's all the fuss about. So topics we'll cover today are what is post-operative delirium? Why should you care? What's the state of the science so far? And I'll share some useful tips. I'm on a funded PhD of post-operative delirium. So the definition of delirium in general has changed over the years. Uh, the current iteration of the definition of delirium is the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual version 5 uh, uh, definition. It's a little bit wordy, but, but when we go through it, you'll, you'll see it actually makes sense. Um, so the first thing is that there is a disturbance in awareness, that's, that's orientation in, in one's environment and attention, so the ability to direct, focus, sustain, and shift attention. This should be acute onset. By acute, they mean hours and days, not minutes or seconds. And it, it should fluctuate. So it waxes and wanes. There must be at least one additional cognitive impairment. And the caveat is that the disturbance of awareness and attention and the added cognitive impairment must not be explained by pre-existing or evolving illness. So for example, if a patient has had a stroke, an evolving stroke, they might be confused, uh, they might not remember their name, that's not delirium, that's stroke. Also, when they have an altered level of arousal, altered level of consciousness, that can impact on a person's cognitive abilities. That's not delirium. And that's why the previous definition of delirium in um, DSM-4 had it has a disturbance in consciousness, well, but they had to remove, remove that and make changes to awareness and attention. And finally, you, it must be that there is no, no it occurs as a, a direct cause, consequence of other medical conditions or multitude of etiologies. And post-operative delirium does not occur by magic. Something causes it. That's just the sentiment behind that. A lot of people have said, well, post-operative delirium, post-operative cognitive dysfunction, what's the difference? So I thought I'd put up this slide to show the differences. Post-operative delirium usually occurs within one week of, of, of surgery and can last up to, up to a week, um, I'm sorry, up to a month. Uh, post-operative cognitive dysfunction, although you may see papers that talk about post-operative cognitive dysfunction within one or two weeks of surgery, Really, we shouldn't be diagnosing this until after 30 days after surgery. Uh, Post-operative delirium waxes and wanes, as we said earlier during the DSM uh, 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 diagnosis. Post-operative cognitive dysfunction seems to be a fixed dysfunction that may last up to one year. I'll talk a little bit more to qualify that fixedness in a minute. Um, the Diagnosis of post-operative delirium, we just use the DSM-5 criteria, as we said, um, that, uh, and usually by a psychiatrist, that's the gold standard. For those of us that are non-psychiatrists, we use tools like the confusion assessment method of, of um, uh, Professor Inouye, uh, like the um, 480 method of, of, of Professor McLaughlin from the UK here. Uh, 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 like the delirium rating scale. Um, there are lots of skills you can use to assess as a non-psychiatric assessor of post-operative delirium. Uh, for diagnosis of post-operative cognitive dysfunction, we use uh, neurological batteries. And, and it's, it's really sad that in the 21st century, we haven't really got a consensus as to which set of, of uh, uh, neuropsychiatric battery tests to use. There was a systematic review published, I think, this month, April, which showed that there were about 250 methods of assessing post-operative cognitive, cognitive dysfunction, which doesn't translate to homogeneity in research when we try to 
to synthesize the results of these different research findings. The thing about, uh, about this uh, neurocognitive battery is that patients can learn the appropriate response. So earlier I said that the cognitive dysfunction is fixed and can last for up to one year. But because of learning, it might appear that the person is getting better because you're repeating the same battery of tests to assess their, their trajectory over time. Uh, so one must be mindful of that. A good paper on, on the differences between post-operative cognitive dysfunction and post-operative delirium and, and just new nomenclature of post-operative cognitive disorders uh, is by uh, Liz Everett in, in, in uh, Australia and is referenced below. So that's post-operative delirium and uh, what is post-operative cognitive dysfunction. But why should you care? Because of the short and long-term implications, the scale of the problem and the cost implications. So on short-term implications, I haven't put an exhaustive list here, but I've put some, a few important things. Increased mortality, you know, increased risk of death, basically. The odds ratio is 7.35. So they're 7.35 times more likely to die if they're over 65 years old and experience post-operative delirium. Um, it's not a fixed number, so it's a range of 1.49 to 36.18. I think it's significant. Uh, prolonged stay in hospital, a hospital bed, I think now costs about, uh, uh, hospital stay, I think now costs about uh, 250 pounds a night, the last time I checked. Uh, so, so three or four days extended stay is 1,000 a a thousand pounds. Uh, you got an older person who's been functioning well at home, independent, drinking their coffee out of their own mug, sitting in their own chair. They come to hospital because they fell and broke their head. They have surgery, they have post-operative delirium. A significant proportion of those people will not get to go back home to drink coffee out of their own mug, sit in their own chair, uh, because they will need institutional care. By this, I'm not talking about going to rehab before going home. I'm talking about going to a nursing home uh, for the longer term. This, this, this is devastating for older people. Again, reference at the bottom for, uh, for people who care to look at details of short-term consequences. Longer term outcomes, I'm just focusing on dementia. Uh, the loss of ability to think for yourself, remember who you are, remember the contribution you've made to society is a devastating illness to have. Um, and there is an association. I'm careful to use the word association. In older people who have had post-operative delirium, there is an association five years later um, uh, with a 66% incidence in dementia. Uh, whereas older people, over 65 years old who have not had post-operative delirium have an 8% incidence of dementia five years later. Uh, and, and it's thought that that 8% reflects, you know, population rates of, of dementia, 66%. So it's association, i.e. Um, it's not cause and effect, um, or, or there's no evidence here that it's cause and effect. It is possible that the patient was already on the trajectory to developing dementia, and therefore they had an intrinsic vulnerability, and the surgery anesthesia intervention uh, gave them such a, a stimulatory load uh, that they unmasked their brain vulnerability with post-operative delirium. It may be that post-operative delirium uh, causes dementia as well. Who knows? More research is required to elucidate that. A scale of the problem, if you consider the fact that 25% of the UK surgical population is age over 70 years, and I think the age over 60 years approaches 60%, we're talking about people of age over 65 years. All these figures I got from Office of ONS, Office of National Statistics. Uh, they have a, a med a healthcare database. Um, so if you consider that 25% of, of the UK surgical population is age greater than 70 years, and the incidence of delirium in people over 65 years is 15 to 53%. That's a significant proportion of the UK 
UK surgical population who are at risk of getting delirium. So I said dementia earlier, delirium, not dementia, um, after surgery. So that's important. And cost implications. Well, well, nobody's actually measuring delirium, not in a consistent manner. Although the NICE guideline says if you're age over 65, if you have hip fracture surgery, if you're acutely unwell, if you have cognitive impairment and you get admitted to a UK hospital, this is not and, 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 this is or, age over 65 or, then you should be assessed for, for alteration in your, in your attention and awareness. But it's not globally, globally uh, implemented. So we don't know what proportion of our population have post-operative delir delirium at the moment. Um, the problem with having talked about dementia earlier is I keep mixing up the words up. Anyway, so, but we know that they have prolonged hospital stays. So that's a cost. They might need institutionalization, so that's a cost. And they might have longer term cognitive impairments, so that's a cost that the NHS at the moment could probably do with avoiding. But the one factor that I didn't put on my on the original slide of why should you care, but it's a really important factor, is what are the consequences for the individual patient? I'm over 65, I'm coping in my home, I'm living in fear of getting dementia and going into a nursing home, and I have a hip fracture, that loss of independence, that loss of a self personal identity, that, 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 that personal pride uh, could be eroded by just getting post operative delirium because of its consequences. This is so significant, it's so important. So let's go to the state of the science now. We'll go over some history, we'll look at risk factors, and we'll look at etiology. Uh, Edwin Papyrus, I don't know if I mentioned this earlier. It's the oldest surgical textbook. It was it's thought to be written by, by Imhotep, who was the, the physician to, uh, what's his name, Pharaoh Joza. Uh, it's, uh, it's about three to 4,000 years old. So this is, this is how long we have been sciencing in medicine. Uh, and this treatise is on treatment of, 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 of orthopedic injuries. Um, so let's look at some history. We won't, we won't look at it exhaustively. Uh, so, so delirium is not new. So Hippocrates, 4, 000, around 4,000 uh, before the common era, I think it's called now, identified that some people who have a fever either get really agitated or get really lethargic. And, he, and they call this phrenitis and uh, lethargy, leth lethargus. And he also identified that actually the ones that actually get very quiet are the ones that are most likely going to die. So this is 400 BC. So this is 2,500 years ago. So we've known about delirium in general, not just post-operative, but delirium in general, since at least around 400 BC. He also suggested that if somebody gets agitated and delirious, you just put them somewhere where they can't hurt themselves. You know, you turn down the lights or blow out the candles, try to make very little noise and let them just work their way through it, which is still kind of what we do today. Um, the terminology delirium uh, uh, dates back to Celsus, who, who, who said, well, people who get phrenitis and leth lethargos, they're like people who, you know, when you have a, a, a plow, it, that is supposed to be digging in nice long furrows that deviate from the forest. The, the brain has deviated from the line, delirium, deviated from the line, delirium. Um, descriptions of hyperactive or hypoactive delirium during the Justinian plague, uh, a historian called Procopius just documented details of what he observed in the people who were suffering from this uh, Justinian plague, and he described features of both hyperactive and hypoactive delirium. So it's not new. The first, the earliest reference I could find to um, post-operative delirium was by Andrew Parry in, 16, in the 16th century. And this was in relation to, to, to injuries, to orthopedic, it was a war trauma of surgeon. Uh, and, and this was in relation to that. He noted that people who had lost a lot of blood uh, got really agitated and confused, confused uh, after they had their relevant limb amputated. 
So risk factors, predisposing factors, that put a list up there. Uh, I've put the relative risk there, old age, high relative risk, cognitive impairment, dementia. There are other things that have lower relative risk, but still significant. Uh, uh, visual impairment, hearing impairment. These are things we don't, we don't sometimes don't pay much attention to, but you know, every little counts. Um, a beautiful article uh, called uh, Delirium in Elderly People, written by, again, uh, Professor Inouye, uh, is available from The Lancet. as it has a lovely overview of delirium and post-operative delirium, which is worth your while looking at if you're interested. Um, so, as presupposing past practice, what are precipitating factors? Again, it's not an exhaustive list. What also I've done there is I've put the things that are a little bit relevant to us. So anesthesia, surgical intervention, yes. Pain, so we can do something about pain. Uh, constipation, you know, when we write our OM of QDS and Zoom of and all that, uh, think about constipation. Uh, uh, dyshomeostasis, I need not explain to you about uh, normal temperature, normal glucose, normal electrolyte, optimized blood pressure. Drugs, benzodiazepine. Mm. I will say no more about that. So, a patient gets delirium. What are the things that keep the delirium ongoing? You know, what are the perpetrating factors? So, they're in a strange hospital. Then, ITU now having had their surgery, the lights are on all the time. What's daytime? What's nighttime? Where am I? Who am I? It's noisy all the time. Oh, we're going to move you to the ward at 10 p.m. We've got a ward bed now. You haven't given me my glasses. You haven't given me my hearing aid. Or you've put those boxing gloves on me because you think I'm going to take out my arterial light. These are things that are within our ilk as, as a anesthetist intensivist uh, uh, to control perpetrating factors. So what is the etiology of post-operative delirium or delirium in general? Um, well, so there have been loads of hypotheses. Cognition is really complex because there's so many brain centers and the interaction between the brain and the rest of the body uh, that are involved in any cognitive function. So cognition, delirium, psychiatry uh, are really complex. So, so while we don't have definitive, this is the thing that's causing post-operative delirium, there are some hypotheses, and I'm not going to go through the details of the hypotheses. They are, as they're called, neuronal aging, neuroinflammation, uh, network disconnectivity, systemic integration failure. It's, it's, it's system integration failure. They're all self-explanatory. If you are interested in it, I highly uh, recommend the Mal Donaldo uh, update, updated hypothesis. A beautiful read. In fact, the image there is from Maldonado, always is originally from Dante. And that image shows how when we cause an injury to a person peripherally, like, okay, uh, cut them because we're operating on them, there's an increase in cytokines in the system. And this increase in cytokines, the brain registered it, registers it via a few mechanisms. Number one is the cytokines stimulates the vagal nerve and they say, oh, well, we're increasing in number. And the vagal nerve says, okay, I'll transmit this information into the, uh, into the um, uh, dorsal vagal, vagal center in, in the brain. And that then sends the information to higher brain centers. So, so vagal nerve. Um, and, um, some cytokines, I apologize, it's hot, it's summer. Um, some cytokines, will just go across into the brain in limited amount uh, through the um, uh, uh, cir circumventricular organs. These are areas in which the blood-brain barrier just doesn't exist, okay? leaky bits of the brain. And also some cytokines are actually transferred across the blood-brain barrier by saturable protein carriers. So those are the ways in which this peripheral inflammatory um, um, response is translated into, into the brain, or so we think. So with all these theories going on, I thought, okay, how do we simplify it? And this is what I think the etiology of post-operative delirium is. The patient comes to hospital, he brings his brain with him. His brain has its intrinsic vulnerability 
and the patient has their intrinsic vulnerability. Then we add to that something we do to them in hospital. This could just be being admitted for a medical problem, having an operation, how we interact with the patients, giving them something familiar in the environment, and making sure we're providing them or not with their usual aids, hearing aid glasses. So the combination of this and the intrinsic vulnerability is what results in occurrence or not of post-operative delirium. That's my simple take on it. So what are the things that as anesthetists we need to consider when we're looking after patients over age over 65 years who've come in for, who are coming in for, for, for a surgical intervention? Well, it all starts with a preoperative assessment. So again, you know, these are things we already do. Uh, we make sure they're well hydrated. If we're not, please let's make sure they're well hydrated. Pain control starts before surgery. Ask them about the hearing aids. Do you use hearing aids? Do you use glasses? Um, it's aspiration, aspirational to expect all of them to have had a comprehensive geriatric assessment. I think in hip fractures now, the orthogeriatrician tries to see all the patients. Uh, I don't know if that's the same in other older people surgery. But most important, uh, avoid surgical delay. I remember seeing a gentleman who had dementia, not delirium this time, dementia, but he was a functional dementia. I was very surprised when I went to him, answered all my questions appropriately, still independent, well controlled on whatever medication he's on. And he came in for emergency surgery and the plan was to roll him till the next day. And I went to speak to surgeons and we both understood the impact of delayed surgery being in an unfamiliar environment uh, would, could have on his cognitive function. I must just segue and mention that patients who come in with dementia can develop delirium. In fact, they're more likely to develop delirium. Um, so if I come in with dementia with a certain level of, of functioning and I have delirium after my hip fracture surgery, that will reset my level of functioning to a lower level because I had post-operative delirium, which will last the rest of my life. So this, this, is, this, is, this, is, a, this is a significant complication in people with dementia. Um, so that was just a bit of a segue. Intraoperative factors. The, the factors have been supported by evidence, regular paracetamol, regular NSAIDs, supported by evidence because it's pain control for NSAIDs really in this current era where we're worried about, about uh, 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 myocardial infarction in older people with NSAIDs and we're worried about um, uh, gastric, perforating gastric ulcers. So maybe not currently, but actually nobody's ever looked and said, okay, risk benefits um, how do we measure the risk in older people of NS that NSAIDs constitutes? I think Professor Moffat's actually working on that at the moment. Dexmedetomidine, thumbs up, lots of support to say it reduces the incidence of postoperative delirium. That's dexmedetomidine used in surgery. Um, the papers on that now. Neuroaxial block to reduce uh, 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 morphine, morphine use. Uh, uh, as a, as a uh, co-agent for anesthesia, as part of your multimodal analgesic uh, uh, approach, absolutely. So those are things that are supported by evidence. So when I say please use with caution, I'm not saying please use, I'm saying no, be cautious if you need to use this, uh, unless it's already part of the patient's usual medication, benzodiazepines and gabapentinoids. Lots of evidence to show that these are associated with an increased incidence of post-operative delirium. So unclear evidence. There's evidence that inhalational agents may be neurotoxic, but the studies that have compared total intravenous anesthesia with inhalational have not really showed any, any, any uh, benefit of TIVA over inhalational when it comes to post-operative delirium. Having said that, when I'm 70 and I need surgery, I would prefer TIVA. Um, 
perioperative ketamine, there is no benefit uh, from the podcast trial podcast is perioperative um, delirium and complications after surgical therapies, uh, which was a big uh, uh, RCT, but but systematic reviews and meta-analysis have not really shown the benefits of using ketamine, uh, which makes sense because we know that ketamine has associated with it uh, um, hypnagogic and hypnopompic hip, hypnopompic uh, hallucinations. So it makes sense that oh, come on, you, you uh, it, we wouldn't be expecting it to to have a, a protective effect on post-operative delirium. I protect patients from post-operative delirium. Process EEG as is currently used. So I, I can't leave that statement there without, without clarifying things. So process EEG, yes, is great for reducing the amount of anesthesia you give to a patient. Reduced anesthetic load uh, correlates with better post-operative performance, yes. But the other aspects of process EEG and, and uh, um, the uh, cerebral oximetry, which are not routinely used in people who are age over 65 at the moment, except maybe in cardiac surgery, which I think we might benefit from looking at. For example, the spectrogram in the processed EEG. Goal-directed therapy, you know, it makes sense to me, uh, but apparently the, the evidence is, is unclear. Post-operative factors, Two things I will say on this, analgesia, analgesia, that's one thing, I'll do. analgesia, analgesia. And the other thing I would want to say is please give them their hair in it, their glasses. You know, uh, uh, you know this is important. Write, write their IV fluids, that, that, that would make a, a, a lot of difference as well. When I wake my older people up, I say, hello, whatever your name is, John, Bill, Mabel, whatever. You're in Queens Medical Center, you've just had a hip fracture operation, Operation went very well. You're just waking up. Today is Thursday, the 25th of December, whatever. A gentle reorientation. So some interesting articles to read. Uh, a lot of them are, uh, a lot of them are only four, but um, uh, major randomized controlled trials, systematic review, meta-analysis, that kind of thing for people who are interested. So just a reminder that, um, uh, you know, when a patient is delirious, there, there is a trigger for the delirium. So just consider what could be causing this patient's delirium. And also to remind you that uh, delirium is a medical emergency when it occurs in people aged over 65, um, having surgery anesthesia intervention. And I thank you very much for your time. I hope this has been useful. Thank you. Thank you.